Hey you guys, welcome to my November 2nd DVD update, where I talk about all the DVDs and Blu-rays I've got over the last two weeks or so. I have some really cool box sets in this one, three pretty cool sets to talk about in this one, Now the, and a bunch of other titles as well. Now the first one that you can get, it's the Cara Burnett Show box set, and it's one you can only get the specific set from carolondvd.com. I took the things out. Now for people that don't know the Cara Burnett Show though, it's a sketch show from the late 60s up until I think it was like 78? And then it had a spin-off series. One of the real popular characters on this on the show, which always played Cara Burnett's mother, was like the mama character. And what was funny was the woman who played that character was way younger than Cara Burnett, but she had a spin-off show that happened, I think it was like three or four years later after the show ended, maybe even five years, and that was the one that I remember watching a lot as a kid, and you know, when it was on reruns and some of the late episodes, and it was Mama's Family, which is one I really liked. But inside of it, it comes with a booklet, you know, that shows the, some of the characters, you know, the actors from the show and some of the characters um, that they played and some things about the show and like quotes and things like that. And um, inside of it though, you can, it has two exclusive bonus discs and it has interviews with people like Jane Lynch, Amy Poehler, Steve Lawrence and has some appearances with um, Cara Burnett on the Gary Moore show and also it has extra skits with Lucy, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, Jerry Lewis. Now like I said it's a really fun sketch show from the 70's, sketch variety show because they would have like acts and stuff come on and perform and things like that. But if you haven't seen the show, like I said, it's like sketches and things like that. And it was from, like I said, the late 70s, the 60s to the mid 70s, uh, like I think 78, like I said. You know, it's a really fun show. It's kind of cool too watching the sets now, um, because it, you know, it kind of is like a throwback to when you watch these kind of shows, like SNL, the old ones, it's kind of almost like a time capsule of what was going on during the time. And it also shows you how different comedy was back then. And, you know, kind of the stuff you could get away with then. And now, since things are a little more politically correct, the kind of things that they would do then that you would never get away with now without a huge problem. So that, it's like interesting seeing the differences and things like that. And like I said, you can only get the special features in this box set. And um, it has, you know, some of the guest stars on this thing, though. It's got, you know, Steve Martin, Joan Rivers, Shirley MacLaine. It's got um, Betty White. Dick Van Dyke, tons of people. This is a really fun, you know, sketch show from the 70s. So definitely check this one out and definitely go to the Carol on DVD if you want this special set. You can also get it signed as well. And the next one I want to talk about, this is one I really, was really excited about. It's from Universal. It's the Alfred Hitchcock, The Masterpiece Collection. Now, first I want to talk a little bit about how I first discovered Alfred Hitchcock films, started getting into them. Um, I remember back, in, you know, years ago when Universal had this really cool thing you went to, and it was an Alfred Hitchcock show. I don't know if they had it in the L.A. location, but they had it in the Florida location. I think now it's like Shrek, Shrek 4D or something there something like that. But you used to go into this thing and they would do like kind of, they were talking about the birds and I think they were talking about how they did the sounds or something like that and they did the, with the green screen, then they went in you would see a, um, like a reenactment of the psycho shower scene. They were talking about his effects and how he did things and stuff like that. And it was a real cool show. And then you went out there, there was kind of like a museum of Alfred Hitchcock posters and things like that. There was a gift shop. And I remember buying for the first time, I think, The Birds. And I think I wanted to watch Psycho at the time. And I was like too young at, the, at that time to watch it. But I bought Birds and a couple of other movies there. And that was kind of how I first got into it. And back at that time, too, Universal still had the Psycho House in Florida, which I think was the Psycho House they used in the later sequels. And Alfred Hitchcock now, you know, also in high school I saw a number of his other films like Rope and Vertigo, which are in this set. But now Alfred Hitchcock is having a major, you know, resurgence with the two new Alfred Hitchcock films. The one that HBO did, The Girl, which was talking about, you know, his relationship with Tippi Hedren on The Birds and kind of like the problems that went on, and then the new Alfred Hitchcock movie talking about the making of Psycho that um, Anthony Hopkins is in, which I'm really, really looking forward to seeing that one. Now, in the set, I'm going to talk about what's in it and what movies are in this. Now, the cool thing about this set is a number of these movies are only in this set on Blu-ray. Like, I don't think very few of them are actually out to buy any other way at the moment. But in you know inside of it, it comes with a booklet. 
and it has like stills and posters from the movies and talks a little about, bit about the films and things like that for Psycho and basically all the movies that are in here. So that's a pretty cool thing. Now the movies that are in here, and I'll talk about two of some of my favorite ones, but it, here's the what it looks like. And inside it's got, um, it has the um, Saboteur is the first one filming here, Shadow of a Doubt. And all these movies, I look through them, all look really good. Now, Rope is one I remember seeing in school. I remember they played, and I really liked it. All done in a continuous, well, it's made to look like it was done in a continuous shot, like one take without any cuts. Very cool technique. And there's been a couple movies recently that have done that, have tried to do those one take things. It also was one of the first movies, like, very early on, it had some problems because it kind of hinted to the two main characters being gay. So I remember there was a lot of, when you read about it, there was a lot of, like, places that wouldn't show it and things like that. It shows you how different things were then. And also, you know, Rear Window, this is, like, one of the real classic ones. The Trouble with Harry, and the discs are all in here, you know, right behind it. I, I don't mind the case for this at all. Some people haven't liked these kind of cases. I don't mind, I really don't mind them. It has The Man Who Knew Too Much, Vertigo, which is another, like, must-see one, um, North by Northwest, and then, of course, Psycho, which is my personal favorite of his movie. Like, I really like that. I even like the sequels. I know people don't really love them. I, I like the sequel. I know they're doing a new Bates Motel TV series now, so I'm definitely interested in seeing that. And then The Birds, which was interesting to watch again, knowing about what was happening to Tippi Hendren and all the abuse and the stuff with the takes where they had her do like 150 takes when the birds were flying in her face. Of course, you don't never know how much of that is kind of exaggerated. You know, it could be attention. You don't really know. That's the thing. Um, you know, Marnie, which is another one that the girl documentary talks about. Um, Alfred Hitchcock's Torn cur Curtain. Um, Topaz. And Frenzy, which is another really cool one. And then this one you don't hear about as much, Family Plot. So I remember finding out about that one. I think they used to play it on the Encore Mystery Channel a lot. I think that was how I first ended up seeing that one. But like I said, this is a very cool set. And if you love Alfred Hitchcock, it's a must-see, you know, must-get set. And like I said, pretty much all these, except for like two of them, except for Psycho... I think North by Northwest you can only get in this set. You know, all the other ones are not out yet. And the next one I want to talk about is the Blade Runner 30th Anniversary Edition. It comes with a toy in this set, as well as um, the theatrical version of the film, the director's cut, the international cut, and um, what was the other one in here? The final cut, which was a 2007 cut, when they put these movies out on HD, DVD, and Blu-ray back in 2007. It also has the work print version. It comes with a booklet with pictures and things like that from the film, like concept art and things like that. Now, the movie's directed by Ridley Scott. You know, this has always been a personal favorite science fiction, futuristic movies. Like, I really always love these kind of futuristic movies. And there's been a lot of movies that you can tell have kind of borrowed from this kind of look. And the one thing that this, this gets right is really puts a lot of work into really having a futuristic and the whole vibe of the thing and just making it kind of look like a future that would be kind of interesting, like, you know, who knows if it's going to look like that. Kind of like the, you know, when it comes to other futuristic looks, the um, Back to the Future 2 was the other one that always kind of like I wished it would kind of look like that. And, you know, we're like only a few years off from that and I think two years and I don't think it's going to look like that. But the movie's basically about these replicants, which are kind of like clones, like cyber kind of clones of humans. And, you know, they basically are used as sort of slaves for labor and things like that. And they end up becoming illegal and put on this planet. And a number of them end up escaping. And Harrison Ford's character is a Blade Runner. And that character is, has to find these people and kill them. And the interesting thing about these, these um, the characters or the replicants is they only have, they have a failsafe and they only can live for um, three years. And the reason why they're coming to Earth is to find their creator and try and find a way for him to basically force them into fixing it so they can live longer. And, you know, taking off the failsafe. So it's kind, of, it's kind of a sad thing about it. Because, like, even though these things are they're sort of bad a little bit, they're also, you can tell why they're doing it. That stars, you know, Harrison Ford, Rugger Howard, and I really like Sean Young in the character. She's a 
one that it's a replicant that Harrison Ford ends up kind of falling in love with and kind of like is torn between what to do. Like, you know, this also has amazing synth music by the by the Vangles. And if you like like uh, Tangerine Dream music, things like that, you will love this music. Now, a lot of people always talk about which version of the movie is the best. I really personally like the director's cut. I and I and the international cut has like a little bit of extra gore. But the director's cut one, I, I like the narration being gone. Like, the narration is okay, but I don't know. It's something about, like, the music kind of gets to pop a little more without the narration, and I kind of like that with it being gone. The narration also kind of had this vibe to it, like it was sort of done in the bathroom or something. Like, it, I can see why Ridley Scott didn't like it. Like, there wasn't a ton of life behind it. It was kind of like, where are there down the corner? Like, I see why he's, like, really adamant about it being gone and, like, really dislikes it. But, um... This is a really good science fiction movie. This is definitely a cool set to pick up. Like, if you love sci-fi movies and futuristic ones, this is definitely, a, like, pretty much one of the best ones. Now, the next one is from Warner Brothers as well. This is a really funny movie. Now, the character, the actor that really stands out in this one, and it's the campaign that really stands out to me more, is um, Zach Galifianakis. Um, Will Ferrell at Ferrell is really good in this, but Zach Galifianakis really steals the show in this movie. And, you know, shows that he can do a lot of different characters. And can be pretty funny. The, the, the concept of this movie was um, Will Ferrell basically runs for Congress in this town. It's a very small town. And he basically runs on a post. So it's basically every single year, year all he does is just sign the paper and he's put into Congress. And, and, but um, these two tycoons that kind of um, played by um, Dan Aykroyd and... Um, I don't remember. Oh, yeah, John Lithgow. They basically have this idea of they want to bring cheap labor, like from China, to um, like a China factory to this town, so they can like make all this money off of it. And they can't get the thing passed because Will Ferrell's character knows that it's not a good thing, and he's not really very bright, but at least he knows this. But they have the idea of, of finding a like kind of like a fool to um, run for Congress and win, so then he, they can get him to pass this thing, not really knowing what it is. So they end up finding whoever they, the, finding Zach Galifianakis' character, who is basically, I think, like one of their cousins or something like that, and they end up getting him to run. So it becomes like a whole thing between the two of them, like doing everything they can to try and get votes, going through all these weird religious type of things, like basically trying to kiss everybody's ass to try and get votes. And that, and the funniest stuff to me was the stuff with Zach Galifianakis and his family at the dinner table. Like, they could have extended that scene for like 15 minutes of them just talking about, um, you know, letting their secrets out on the table. And so, like, that was like one of the funniest scenes in a long time. The movie's also directed by Jay Roach, who did the Meet the Parents films and, um, you know, a, a, the Austin Powers films. Hopefully, another Austin Powers comes out. I, I really would love to see another one. This is a really fun movie. Like I said, too, you, you, I was really surprised with how funny Zach Galifianakis was in this and really steals the movie. Uh, the next one I got from Sony, and it's Arthur Christmas. This is one that I didn't see in theaters, but was kind of interested in it. But, you know, with animation movies, you never know, like... You know, so, sometimes I end up liking them, sometimes I'm like, eh, it was alright. This one I really, really liked a lot. Now, this basically is about on um, Christmas Day, you know, it's so Christmas Eve, um, the current Santa Claus, who's very old, and they all think he's about to retire, and, um, you know, he's doing his deliveries, and the way they do the deliveries is through, like, these ships like a big spaceship, and they and instead of him, like, going around on a sleigh, he has all these elves doing all this work for him. So, like, he has, like, thousands of elves, like, they all drop down and put the gifts. It's an inter interesting concept and different kind of view on a Christmas movie. Like, when it comes to Christmas movies, you know, I try and watch a lot of them, and this is seriously one of the best Christmas movies, I think, since, like, The Santa Claus. Like, I really, really love this, but the, um... The basic thing, though, is, you know, he's delivering the gifts, and one gift ends up being left behind. And his son, he has two sons, one who's they think is going to end up taking over, and he's kind of like the drill sergeant. You know, he's, he's okay, but he's real all about business. And his other son, Arthur, who the main movie's about, 
is kind of goofy and kind of clumsy and like he's sort of always in the, kind of in the way and he works in the mail room you know writing letters back for you know the, all the letters that come to Santa he ends up responding to them and things like that but one gift ends up being left behind that they don't, they don't deliver and um, you know they, they basically aren't going to do anything about it the Santa Claus is basically like uh, and they don't really want to do anything about it they don't think they can go out and do it so Arthur is like doesn't accept this so he ends up going out with his grandfather who was the old Santa so basically after, after a while you retire so he lives with the old you know his grandfather's the Santa so they end up going out in the sleigh they, they still have the old sleigh it's all about the things that happened to them along the way trying to deliver this gift and all the kind of problems that they run into like going the wrong way and all these kind of things it really is a fun really good Christmas film I would really seriously recommend this one um, really like this one a lot. And the next film is They Live. This is a great John Carpenter film. It's from the new Scream Factory line from Shout Factory. They put out Halloween 2 and 3 and um, Fun House and um, Terror Train. Now this one though is one that I really have loved for a long time. I saw this one years and years ago. Watch this one all the time. You know it's like Notorious 2 for having like a 10 minute like one of the longest fight scenes. And it stars Rowdy Rowdy Piper. I really like him as an actor. Like, you know, he doesn't do a ton of movies anymore. He does a couple ones occasionally, but he really is pretty good, and especially good in these kind of parts. The movie, though, is about he's like, Rowdy Rowdy Piper's character works kind of doing construction and sort of just doing kind of like a wanderer, just doing jobs as they come and go. And he ends up finding in the trash or this box of these glasses and like like they're sort of just you know regular looking glasses almost look like 3D glasses and he when he puts these things on he ends up seeing very strange things like he sees signs and they say stuff like believe and buy and like and then he sees people as these you know on the back you see the characters and he sees them as these kind of alien like characters and it's very strange the way, you know, really cool it starts on buck flow I think um was any like a buck something who's always plays um like homeless characters and things like that and um back to the future and he was in wishmaster he's outstanding in this like he was so cool and he's like the um kind of guy who you know the homeless guy and he ends up being kind of taken in by these people but it's him, you know, when he discovers the secret of these glasses, you know, he's being chased by the people. And so it's him trying to, you know, get away from them and trying to kind of find a way to expose them. And um, Meg Foster is in this, and he's kind of ends up going with her and kind of almost sort of kidnapping her and kind of forcing her to help him because he doesn't know what to do so he ends up getting in her car and things like that it's a really cool film like you know John Carpenter did like I said you know of course he did the music and it's outstanding you know 80 cents this is such a good one like you've got to check this one out if you haven't seen it the next one a lot of people have asked me about this one you know what I thought and it's wrong turn five you know wrong turn bloodlines now with the wrong turn movies my personal favorites was the first and second you know the first one and the second one that Joe Lynch did which I really liked the third one I really didn't love the third one you know they, they filmed the third one in um I think Bulgaria and, and had like the accents and you know you know I, I don't I hate when they kind of have someone that has like a real strong accent trying to do an American accent in some of these movies and they can't pull it off and the second one, I mean the fourth one, they went to Canada so it didn't have that vibe. This one has it extreme, like, you know, it was all like br British actors and stuff, and I love British actors. I kind of would rather they just filmed it in England or something, like, or just filmed them here or something, because it's, it's always so weird when they, like, when you hear people trying to cover up their accents and they're like, let's go over there, and like, it's like all of a sudden it's like, Oh my god! And like you, they just come out like so many times in these movies. And it's like, and it kind of takes away from it a little bit. And but it stars the um, the Doug Bradley basically. The, the concept though of this, the plot of this was, it's basically the same thing about you know them out in the woods, and it's about this kind of, um, jungle, some kind of convention that's going on. 
um, like not a convention, like a party they're having, like the wolf, I don't know what, what it was called, I, uh, Wolfman Jack, I don't even know, but they're having some kind of convent, like festival or something, and they didn't show much of this festival, kind of like we're having it, but they, they didn't use the festival, like I would have done a lot of stuff at the festival with them, like killing everybody there, they didn't use, do a lot of stuff they could have done, the sets in this kind of had a bit of a cheapness, but, but, you know, like I said, I love the fourth one, the fourth one got it together so good, and then this one, but, you know, it stars Doug Bradley. Doug Bradley was really good. I couldn't tell if he was supposed to be British or what. I, I couldn't figure it out. But it's like him and his boy, you know, the boys, which are the, you know, the mutants. And, of course, it had a lot of that. <laughs> and this one, though, it all looked like, like Jesus masks. And, like, you kind of see the eye holes. And it was kind of like they were just sort of put on kind of quick. And, like I said, you know, I'm not one of the kind of person that says bad stuff about movies. But this one... You know, it was okay. It was all right, but it had a lot of weird problems to it. And a lot of just strangeness to it. It was not any way better than that fourth one, which I really love, like the fondue scene when he was cutting off the stuff and to making fondue and eating. That was, like, brilliant. The fourth one was outstanding. It's the same director, and I love the fourth one. This one just was like... Like I said, though, he ends up getting kidnapped. Doug Bradley, who ends up, like, being the keeper of these you know, like the mutants or whatever you would call them, and they end up coming to the town to try and rescue them, and they're killing off the people along the way. I don't know. I really don't. It's like, I don't know. And the next one I got from um, MPI, from the IFC Midnight Line. This one, though, I'm, I'm going to admit, absolutely, like, two scenes in this scared the absolute shit out of me. Like, you know, and I don't get scared very much by stuff, you know, movie-wise. And there was, like, two things in this that were so, like, creeped me out so bad, I couldn't even believe it. But the movie is about this, um, you know, these, this sister's, you know, these two girls, their mother just died. The one girl is there at the house, you know, getting the house together, you know, going through things and stuff like that. And she ends up calling her sister and says, you got to come here. Come on. I, I need you here. And um, right after she gets off the phone, she ends up calling her you know, on Skype, her, you know, her daughter, and talks to the, her cousin who's watching her, and they're like, Mommy, what was that behind you? And she's like, I don't know. And then, basically, you see her walk into a closet, and then it cuts to the sister coming there, gets to the house, and the sister, the one's missing. And she has all these messages from the cousin going, Oh, I, I can't reach your sister. I've been calling, I've been calling. I can't reach her. What's going on? Can you find her? Is she there? And then they're all like, Well, she... You know, she's done this stuff before. She gets kind of, you know, when bad things are going on, she kind of just disappears. But the basic thing, though, is that there's something very strange going on in this house. And, you know, kind of like things are happening. Lights are going off. You kind of feel the presence of things. And um, there's also a sequence in here when they um, bring in a girl who kind of can talk to and experience, like, you know, when things are there, possessions and stuff. She's blind. There's a real creepy thing with her. And like I said, though, there was this one sequence in this. Whoa. You know, I mean, it was like, whew. And I don't know. It was, like, really creepy. And there was also, um, like, the way to this movie kind of, the payoff to this movie was pretty cool. And there's a movie, and I'm not going to say what it is, but it's a movie I talk about a lot. It's a 70s TV movie, and, it, and it's like, whoa, it's a little bit like that. But definitely check this out. This is a really cool, extremely creepy, successfully creepy movie that like really got to me in like one or two things. The next one is from um, MPI as well, and it's Your Sister's Sister, and it stars um, Emily Blunt, and Mark Duplass, I think Mark Duplass directed um, the Jeffrey Lives at Home with his brother, I'm pretty sure. Um, this is a really pretty good one. Mark Duplass is basically kind of depressed because about a year ago his brother died. Yeah, and he just kind of hasn't been able to get over it. And he's kind of been in a lump and he's kind of can't move on with his life and can't find any type of happiness, can't get a relationship, he's just sort of a mess. 
and Emily Blunt, who's and I'm, I'm I was kind of, I'm pretty sure Emily Blunt was dating the brother, and they were probably like pretty close, and they became friends and stuff. Basically, says you should go up to my you know family's cabin and try and spend a, a couple weeks up there and try and get yourself together, and you know just you know have some time to think and think about what you want to do with your life and things like that. But when he ends up getting there, Emily Blunt's sister is there as well at the same time. So they end up running into each other, and they're like, oh, I have to, you know, then they kind of start talking. And Emily Blunt's sister just got out of, her, out of a relationship with a woman, so she's a lesbian, the, the character. And um, Emily Blunt's sister is played by Rosemary DeWitt, and they end up, you know, the... Um, Mark du Mark's char Duplass's character ends up sleeping with her because they're kind of like getting so drunk and they end up sleeping together. It becomes a very awkward thing. And um, he's like, oh, I don't think you should tell your sister about this. Because the, the bottom line is that he ends up really, he really likes Emily Blunt and it's kind of like this whole thing about them trying to keep it from her while they're there. And it's got this real awkward vibe going on. This was a really pretty good one. And I read too that most of this movie well, a lot of it was done improvised. It was in, I thought it really worked and came across very natural. Also, they shot it like in 12 days, which was pretty amazing to shoot something like this that quick. Really good romant, you know, romantic relationship film. I always really liked Emily Blunt, too. I thought she did a really good job in this. It, the one thing that was kind of weird, though, was the sister didn't have an accent. But they kind of explained it, but I still was kind of confused about it. That was the only thing. And the next one I got from MPI as well is Americano. It stars um, Selma Hayek is in it for a little bit. But the movie is basically about this guy who lives in France. You know, he lived out in America with his mother for a number of years, ended up recently going back. Kind of is always back and forth between France and America. Well, his mother just died, so he ends up finding out about it, ends up going there to end up trying to sell the house off and get rid of it. But when he's there, he ends up finding out that his mother left the house to this woman, you know, who was a very good friend, they became very good friends, and um, the woman's played by Selma Hayek, and apparently, too, this, the guy had, was friends with Selma Hayek's character when he lived there years back before, so the movie is him going to Mexico, where, because she ended up getting, going back to Mexico for one reason or another, so it's him going there and trying to track her down, and then trying to tell her that, you know, about how the house was left, and he really doesn't want to because he doesn't really understand why his mother left the house to him, to her, and all she did was leave these paintings to him. She just, so, so it's kind of him there, and she's working as a stripper in this kind of seedy strip club, and it's him trying to find the right words to tell her. So it's all that kind of thing. I thought this was, was, was okay. The trailer, too, was a really strong trailer. But I just didn't absolutely love this movie. I thought it was, for the most part, an interesting one. Just didn't love this. The next one, this is one I was really interested in seeing. Um, and it's a Scout Taylor Compton film called 24-7. It's about the group of these friends that are staying up in this cabin. And the cabin is owned by Tyler Maine's character. Tyler Maine was really pretty cool in this. And... Um, they end up, you know, going there. It was kind of interesting, too. Like it said, when I look, was looking up about it, it's like filmed in Georgia. And then I was like, read it, and I was like, wait, Georgia the country. Like, I never even knew there was a Georgia the country. But, you know, it was filmed in Georgia the country. That's why, because it had a real kind of unique look outside. Like, I'm like, that's not Georgia. That's somewhere else. I think it might, might have been supposed to be, like, Georgia. I don't know, though. But the movie, like, the people were there, and, um... They end up getting, you know, it's like cold out and snowing, so they go, oh, there's a sauna in there, so let's go out in the sauna. So they're all getting drunk, and that evening they're planning on going to a party, but they don't want to get there too early. So they end up going to the sauna, and they, they, they don't really know what they're doing, so they set the thing so high. And they keep on going, oh, it's so hot, and they're in there drinking, and they're like, eh. and then they have to keep on jumping out into the lake, and then getting back in the sauna, and then drinking more. And they, they're basically just like, ugh. And they keep on going back in and out of there. And then eventually the one guy gets so drunk and, um, you know, he ends up, like, leaving and you hear all these, like, things going on outside. And then what ends up happening is they all end up getting stuck in there. And the other guy, you don't know where he is, and they're sort of locked in a sauna. And it's, like, hot as shit, and they're all in there where they have very little water. 
and it's like a nightmare. You know, I mean, I, I, it was a it was a hard watch just because it was like, oh, because I'm the kind of person who hates heat. So it was like I couldn't even imagine being in there with it getting you know hotter and hotter in this thing, trying to reach the temperature with like no way to get out of this thing. And that's the main concept. And you know, the whole time you're like, is that other friend gonna get him out of there? And, it's it's tough, and like you kind of would think Tyler Maine's character might be one thing. You kind of wonder. Um, it's not an absolutely amazing movie. It's not perfect or anything. But I kind of like I kind of like this. And of course, I got this is one you know you can't not get. And it's um I, it was a pretty decent price at Best Buy. And it's Rosemary's Baby from Roman Polanski. And you know people know all about this one. This is a really good one though about her moving into um, a new, or her husband moving into a new home in this apartment. And um, Ruth Gordon, though, was, I think it was Ruth Gordon, yeah, who was from um, Harrod and Maud. It's, it's a, kind of the neighbor. It's all these kind of weird things going on. And um, it's kind of hard to explain, but like a really good one, though. Now this one, though, is a weird movie from VCI, which I, I've always heard about it. It's one of John Carpenter's, like, very, like, I think he did it when he was in film scores reading about it. And he filmed this for like 50 grand. Dan O'Bannon, who was the writer of the Alien films, Total Recall, director of like the amazing Return of the Living Dead, he actually wrote the star of this thing. It's called Dark Star. It's a really weird science fiction movie. It has elements you could tell um, that were used years later in Alien when they made it, like a couple of years after. I think this was shot. I think the early 70s and came out like around 74. But it's about a group of these people who have been up in space for like 20 years, it's like number of years. And because of space or something, they've only aged two years. So they're up there in this ship. And the sh it's, it's a spoof though. You can't take this seriously because like the bombs talk back to people. Like talking to the bomb, like bomb, react activate. And it's like, all right. It's like all that kind of weird stuff. But they end up up there running into all these kind of problems, like the bomb gets a mind of its own, and there's like this weird alien thing that they have on the ship that's like screwing around, and it's like basically like this blow up like ball with like arms on it. Like I said, it's you can't take this thing seriously. It's a real over the top, weird space spoof. And the fact that they filmed it like, you know, in film school and so it was kind of interesting. And I know it got like a pretty decent release back in the 70s. Like I said though, this is a really weird, um, I mean, if you liked Alien, like, watch this and you'll see, like I said, the weird similarities to it. The next one from Lionsgate is Medea's Witness Protection. You know, and I, I'm kind of like with the Medea movies, like, I usually like the ones when it's, like, more Medea. And this one really was a lot of Medea. Um, I liked the one before, though, a little bit better because I love the stuff with the drive through and stuff. Like, Medea's movies, for some reason, Tyler Perry's movies kind of get, like, a bad rap. I, don't, I really don't have a problem with them. You know, sometimes you get a little tiny bit preachy and you know, all that kind of stuff, but I don't know. Like I, like I said, I liked the other one a little bit more. Um, I saw him in Alex Cross. I, I, I thought he was all right in that. It wasn't a great movie, but um, it was okay. But this movie basically is about Eugene Levy, and he works at this kind of accounting for, firm or something, and his boss, played by Tom Arnold, is basically having this Ponzi scheme and stealing all this money. So Eugene Levy gets to work, and they're shredding papers, and Tom Arnold's like, well, all right, you, you know, this is all in your problem. You knew about this, and he's like you know, going crazy. So he ends up, you know, getting away in a plane, Tom Arnold's character, and Eugene Levy ends up getting kind of in trouble about all this. So he ends up getting put into witness protection because a group of people are after him because, you know, of all the money. They, money was taken from the mob by Tom, um, you know, is it Tom Arnold? I'm, I'm Hopefully I'm saying the right... Yeah, Tom Arnold's character takes all the money, and one of the people was the the mob. So he ends up getting put in witness protection with Medea. And it's kind of like all the things that go on, the kind of problems and things like that. You know, the movie, the, the, it wasn't really a, a, an outstanding movie. It was okay. The things I didn't love about it was I felt like there was a cu couple of, like, missed opportunities for more kind of fish-out-of-water stuff with the family there. There's a kind of, like, you know, when they go with Medea, there was kind of more stuff I thought that they could have done that they didn't do. But, you know, if you love Medea and you like that character, it's pretty... There is some pretty funny stuff with Medea, but, like, a lot of the other stuff just wasn't outstanding. And the next one from Lionsgate as well is Fire with Fire. This is about a, um, a guy who's a firefighter, and, you know, they basically just got out of work, and um, 
he's with his group of his friends who are firefighters. Like, oh, would you go in there and get me some snacks and stuff at this convenience store? And when he's in there, a robbery happens, and um, everybody in there gets killed. And he like witnesses what happens, and um, you know, he ends up being basically put into witness protection so he doesn't because he basically drew a sketch of who the person was and the character is played by Vincent D'Onofrio and he did a pretty good job in this like at first I didn't even know if it was him but he draws a sketch of the you know the guy who was kind of in charge of this robbery and you know he has to testify to put this guy away but they kind of have to hide him out in witness protection to keep him from getting killed because he has all these men out there searching for him basically so you know, to kill him so he can't talk at the jury. So he ends up going into witness protection and he's there with, you know, Rosario Dawson and he kind of like gets a relationship with her and he's just about to get out and then um, they find him. So then the movie becomes, you know, where it really picks up is him trying to find, you know, he just runs away and escapes from the witness protection is uh, kind of looking for him and it's him trying to find all the people that are um, trying to find him and kill him off. So that's the main kind of thing. It's like getting them back. I thought this was a pretty well done one. I, I liked this a lot. I thought Bruce Willis was pretty good. I wish he was in it a little bit more, but it was a pretty good one. The next one is from Sony, and um, it's Wreck 3 Genesis. And I really liked this one a lot. And I, I thought it was interesting, too, what they did, because it was a done found footage in the beginning. It was basically about a couple that were getting married um, on their wedding day and it's basically filming like it opens up basically like a wedding video with like kind of the cheesy opening like oh so and so's wedding the music a photo montage then it cuts to them you know filming the wedding and the friends are going kind of all that kind of stuff and you see at the wedding there's this one guy who's the uncle he's real cheerful and happy guy he ends up having this bite on his arm on his hand and he's like Oh, I got bit by like a something. I forget what he said he got bit by, but he seems real happy. Then you see him later, like you know, throughout the wedding video, he starts looking real pissed looking, and he ends up basically, you know, be turning infecting people. So it's kind of you know, it's a zombie film like the other ones. Um, but then it becomes you know, they all start kind of running, and the the um, after they just got married, the husband and wife end up separated. And um, and at one point, the guy's like, why are you filming all this? This is crazy. The camera drops on the ground and breaks. Then it becomes a real movie, you know, not a found footage. And I thought that was an interesting concept to doing that. Kind of like enough of the found footage and dropping it. I like that. I like how they did that. And, you know, the movie's done kind of tongue-in-cheek a little bit. Almost like... Um, Peter Jackson, like, you know, Dead Alive, and just over-the-top, kind of comical, and I like that. I like those kind of over-the-top, silly kind of horror things. And it had some serious aspects. It also had some great gore scenes with her with the chainsaw and things like that. I really found myself liking this a lot. This is a really pretty good one. The next ones I got from a and &E, and it's Shipping Wars. This is a show about... um. You know, there's a thing called U-Ship, and you basically bid on, you know, moving items. So, like, it's like start start the bid at, like, ten grand to move a giant statue from New York to L.A. And there are, you know, people bidding on it, and it's about, it focuses on um, five different characters. And they basically have a bidding war in the beginning, and then they end up, you know, shipping the things. And it come, ends up having there being kind of all kinds of problems along the way. My favorite characters on this is the um, guy with long hair. Um, he's always, and especially in season two, he's getting kind of like bitter, and like, I don't give a shit about it. But I don't know, I, I like that character. He's kind of real bitter and doesn't really care what anybody says. The other guy with the, like, the handlebar mustache is pretty cool. Uh, in the newer seasons, the husband and wife are no longer on it, and they got replaced by a younger group. Because the, 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 in this one, they weren't really doing much. But like I said, though, then there's also, like, the under, the guy who's kind of new at this, and he doesn't know what he's doing, and he's always screwing things up. I really like these kind of things. This is a really pretty cool one, and it has, um, you know, deleted scenes, I think, like, 22 minutes. And the one thing that was cool with the guy with long hair showing like this alligator or crocodile thing he has. He's like, I've been a couple times. I don't know. I, I love this one. And the other one is American Restoration, and it's um from the History Channel. 
and it's basically a spin-off to, from the Pawn Stars show. If you remember in the early seasons of Pawn Stars, when they had things that needed fixing, like refrigerators and Coke machines and things like that, they would buy. They'd take him to this character and in his shop, and he would like basically restore it to new. And this was the spin-off series with, um, you know, bringing, you know, basically it was just him getting kind of items that are messed up, and him and his team turning things and restoring them. And, you know, basically to, you know, New Order and things like that. I, I like this one, though. They, and the other spinoff one they have recently is um, Counts Customs, the guy who would come and look at cars. I think, like, um, you know, Redmond was talking about this as well. I think it's kind of cool how they can do these kind of spinoffs with these kind of shows. The only thing that's a shame when they do those is then this character isn't really in the Pawn Stars as much. And the next one, this is, like, one of my favorites, and it's Storage Wars Texas. Now, my favorite, like, my favorite, this is my favorite for one specific reason, Mo. Like, the Mo character is a lot like Barry from Storage Wars, but, I don't know, there's something about him that's, like, great. And this, in the new season, he's in it, like, way more, because, like, I was kind of worried Mo was going to be phased out and gone, and, but, like, Mo's back, and, like, in, Mo's in a lot of these, though. He's, like, this foot doctor, and, like, he's always, like, kind of goofy and kind of, I don't know, I love that character. But it's just like Storage Wars, though, but set in, um... Texas. It's funny too, I'm starting to kind of like this one a little more. It's like, I don't know why, I, I really like this show, but it's like them in Texas buying the things and stuff like that. So like I said, just like Storage Wars, they bid on storage lockers. Sometimes they end up getting, you know, great things out of it. Sometimes it ends up being a total bust and they spend all this money and it's, you know, nothing good comes out of it. But if you like Storage Wars, I think you definitely like this one. It's a really fun show. Just, I, I don't know, I really love these kind of shows. The next one from E1, and this is a show I remember in the early 2000s, I think it was like 2000, 2001, and I remember watching this around the same time there's another show, it was like a show everyone always talks about that hopefully it comes out at some point, it's Freaky Links. I always kind of remembered this around the same time this show, that show was talked about as well. This stars Lou Diamond Phillips and it's called Wolf Lake. It's got a real Twin Peaks kind of vibe to it with the music and all that kind of stuff. But um, Lou Diamond Phillips, his girlfriend, you know, they're basically talking about, you know, they're getting real serious and she ends up disappearing. And it's him trying to figure out where she is. And it's like six months have gone by, he can't find her, hasn't heard anything. He ends up getting a call from this guy going, she's at, I've seen her at Wolf Lake, or I think. Yeah, so he ends up going to Wolf Lake to the town and, you know, questioning everybody, and everybody sort of kind of seems weird about it, kind of like the Wicker Man. Goes there, everybody's like, oh, we don't know anything about that. And they, you can kind of tell they're lying and something is going on. So it's him in this town trying to get to the bottom of it. At the same time, there's all this um, stuff with wolves going on, like a tribe of people, a tribe of wolves. So, like, the town basically is werewolves. Um, it's a very well done, like, you know, it's also shot in widescreen, which is pretty cool. Um... You know, because a lot of TV stuff even then wasn't really widescreen, so I'm glad that E1 actually put it in widescreen. It looks really good. Like, it really was shot like a movie. Um, and I, I think that this show would have lasted way longer if it, you know, like around, like now. I think because of things like Twilight and people being more interested in these kind of things now, I think this show would work a lot better now. But it's a very cool one. And the final one I got, and you know, I absolutely love this show. It's the third season of Fantasy On, you know. But it's just fantasy. The plane, the plane, burst. You know, it's tattoo, and um, you know, the main character, and it's basically people who come to the island to live these fantasies, and they basically, you know, go there, and it's like, you know, it has a lot of cool guest stars. You know, it's kind of like the love boat, but it's basically, you know, someone has a fantasy of being like the king for the day, and all, all this kind of stuff. It's a really good one. Now I'm <laughs> looked at the time on this video. I have no idea how long this video is going to end up being. But anyway, though, thanks a lot for watching for subscribing. It's probably a really long video. But um, like I said, I have a lot of stuff to talk about. But anyway, though, I'll see you guys later.